apply to Rutgers Law. Because we know you want to attend law school in a great location with a robust academic experience and pursue a fulfilling career after having graduated with as little debt as possible. You will find this all here at Rutgers Law, as well as a few more things that we are extremely proud of. We are one law school with two locations in Newark and Camden that allow you to access three of the largest legal markets in the United States, New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia. Our Newark location is located just 15 minutes from New York City. Within walking distance is the Essex County Courthouse and U.S. District Court of New Jersey, the Prudential Center, and many great restaurants. Rutgers Law in Newark gained the nickname the People's Electric Law School in the 1970s after a period of activism. Rutgers Law's Minority Student Program was founded in Newark in 1968 and continues to bring a wonderful cohort of students each year. The Minority Student Program, or MSP, is a post-admission program that serves full-time and part-time law students coming from underrepresented groups in the legal profession or disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. After the merge of the law schools in 2015, MSP was brought to the Camden campus, and now students at both locations can benefit from paid summer internship opportunities, networking events with MSP alumni, study groups with upperclassmen, and extended orientation. If you'd like to be considered for MSP when you apply, on your application, you must indicate your interest in the program when it asks. You can also include a diversity statement to be considered. Across the bridge from Philadelphia is Camden University District, featuring Camden County Community College, Rowan's Medical School, and the Rutgers Camden Campus. Within walking distance is the U.S. District Court of New Jersey, the New Jersey Superior Court, and the Camden Municipal Court, while a five-minute train ride will bring you into Center City, Philadelphia. Just within the past few years, new apartments, office buildings, and new park have been built around the waterfront in a period of revitalization. The Camden location has two exclusive programs, Social Justice Scholars and Summer Jumpstart. Summer Jumpstart program requires no application and is open to all admitted Camden students. During Jumpstart, you take one of your core law classes during the summer before starting, typically contracts, helping to ease the transition into law school by acclimating you to the rigors of a course while leaving you with one less class to worry about during the fall. Only one course can be taken in Jumpstart. The Social Justice Scholars Program allows students with a commitment to public service and social justice to earn a small scholarship, mentoring, summer funding, and more in exchange for completing pro bono hours. That application is made available to accepted Camden students in the spring, and each year a group of around 10 students are selected to be Social Justice Scholars. While there are a few different between our locations, there are many more similarities and things that keep us connected, like the holodeck. The holodeck allows students to take courses that are campus exclusive. So democracy and law, which is only offered in Newark, and comparative labor and employment law, which is only offered in Camden, can be made available to all students from the comfort of their home campus. Two identical holodeck classrooms exist in Newark and Camden, equipped with microphones and a camera that creates a live feed between the rooms. Each semester, a list of holodeck courses is released and students can petition to have a course offered in the holodeck. You also have access to the law libraries at either location, which serve the educational and research needs of law school students and faculty. Our students are provided with online research databases that help make legal research a bit easier. And in addition, our reference librarians are happy to help navigate the combined 1.2 million volumes. All of our reference librarians have graduated from law school themselves, so they know how to best address your unique legal research needs. To get a better understanding of life at Rutgers Law, we recommend reading The Brief, which is available on our website and contains blogs written by current law students. There you can read about student organizations, visiting the Supreme Court, networking opportunities through MSP, how there's no such thing as a typical law student, and so much more. Here at Rockers Law, we offer a robust legal education with flexibility and practical training incorporated into everything we do. Students have the option to choose between our full-time and part-time programs to best accommodate their schedule and needs. Our traditional full-time Juris Doctor program takes three years to complete. 
Classes typically take place Monday through Friday between 9 to 5. Your first year schedule is made for you. We will go over the specific courses a little later. Full-time students can work a maximum of 20 hours per week. The part-time evening program takes four to four and a half years to complete. Many students in the part-time program work a nine to five job. So we are excited to announce that beginning in fall of 2021, our part-time evening program has transitioned to a hybrid format. Classes start at 6 p.m. and are typically three or four days per week. The hybrid model is structured so that you will be on campus mostly two nights a week for in-person instruction and you'll have remote instruction no more than two nights per week. Specific court times and schedules vary by campus and year. Part-time students do not have a limit on the amount of hours they can work per week. At the Camden campus, we also offer a part-time day option. This typically applies for people with a full-time job with evening or irregular hours. The part-time day programs will not have hybrid instruction. There are eight core courses all law students are required to take their one all year. These include courses such as contracts, torts, property, legal research and writing, and constitutional law. After the core courses are completed, you are able to create your own schedule with electives. A complete list of electives can be found on our website under the academic tabs or through this link. Whether you want to spend a semester living abroad or take a two week deep dive into a specific topic with a travel study course, students can gain international insight and build global leadership skills. We have partnerships with Leiden University in the Netherlands and the University of Graz in Australia, where you can spend a whole semester studying outside of the US. A trip to Cuba is available through the Community and Transactional Lawyering Clinic and visiting South Africa is part of our South African Constitutional Law class. In addition to the robust legal curriculum you will have access to while here at Rutgers Law, we also value the overlap between law and other academic disciplines. The law school is proudly embedded in Rutgers University, one of the nation's leading research institutions. Because of the rich university resources and our interdisciplinary focus, we are able to offer students more than 11 dual degree options, including JDMD, JDMBA, JDMPA, JDMSW, and several others. For all dual degree programs, you must apply and be admitted separately to each program. The law school will accept up to 12 credits from another program. Once you are a student, you will work with the registrars from both programs to create a plan of which courses will be accepted. Another important thing to note is that some degrees are only offered in some schools. So for example, we offer a JD MA in legal philosophy. The MA in legal philosophy is only available at New Brunswick. So you would complete the law semesters in Camden or Newark, but would have to attend New Brunswick for that portion of your education. Dual degrees like the JD MBA can be completed entirely at Camden or Newark. Check out this link to see where the degrees are offered. This academic flexibility also applies to specialty areas offered here at Rutgers Law. We offer JD certificates in four programs that will allow you to customize your education and develop expertise in the practice area you are most interested in. Our current JD certificate programs include corporate and business law, family law, immigration law, and criminal law and procedure. If you choose to pursue a JD certificate, you will take courses, 15 credits or a variety of electives in this field and complete relevant externship or clinic work. We believe that hands-on practical training is just as important as traditional in-class academic learning. Therefore, we have many opportunities for students to gain real-world experience while in law school, including clinics, journals, externships, and moot court competitions. Rutgers Law School is also a pioneer in clinical education and currently boasts 16 clinics across its two campuses in Newark and Camden, where student casework for actual clients is principally supervised by full-time Rutgers Law faculty. Some of the clinics offered include the Immigrants' Rights Clinic, Child Advocacy Clinic, Education and Health Law Clinic, the Federal Tax Law Clinic, and many more. Students in the clinical education programs learn lawyering skills and development professional identity while working with clients on numerous issues. And we are consistently ranked as one of the top clinical programs in the country in annual surveys.
We also maintain a proud tradition of publishing influential legal scholarship in student-run law journals. In the weeks after 1L year, students can write onto journals at either location. Such journals include Law Review, Law and Public Policy, and Women's Rights Law Reporter. As a journal member, you either write a note or comment for credit and experience to add onto your resume. Externships are open to students who have completed their first year curriculum and would like to gain practical experience by working with attorneys or judges. Externships can help a student discover an interest in a particular, particular area of law. Many legal employers think highly of externships and the valuable research and writing skills students develop. Externships are unpaid. However, a student can receive academic credit for these externships. On our website, you can find a list of locations where you can extern across New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Finally, Rutgers Law students can enhance their advocacy skills by training and competing on teams against other law schools, regionally, nationally, and internationally in mock trial, appellate moot court, mediation, and negotiation and arbitration competitions. Rutgers Law students have a strong record of success at these competitions because of their extensive preparation, excellent coaching, and trial, oral advocacy, and mediation skills. Rutgers Law School is also committed to providing students with meaningful pro bono opportunities that instill an ethic of service while providing much needed legal assistance to the broader community. Through the program, our students develop skills in professional responsibility, problem solving, and leadership, while also internalizing an ethic of service that is central to the legal profession. Our communities of Camden and Newark are the perfect cities in which to provide direct services and develop an appreciation for structural inequities. Students perform pro bono work in a variety of settings. Most of our projects are in-house partnerships with legal service providers focused on bankruptcy, disability rights, educational equity, Iraqi refugee assistance, prisoner reentry, and many other areas. In addition, students often gain approval to work with entities such as the Domestic Violence Unit of the Camden County Family Court and the ACLU. Excitingly, Rutgers Law has spearheaded the New Jersey Innocence Project, which is based out of the Camden campus. The breadth of Rutgers faculty expertise, along with assistance from students, will allow the Innocence Project to offer an impressive array of services, including reviewing requests from prisoners, gathering and examining trial information and investigative records, dealing with forensic issues, assisting in re-entry into the general population, and advocating for better practices and criminal justice reforms. Students can begin participating in some of our pro bono initiatives as early as one all year. And even if you do not intend to practice in the public interest sector upon graduation, our interactive pro bono programs offer you the invaluable opportunity to immediately start developing your legal knowledge and practice skills. Your Rutgers Law School academic experience will be guided by our exceptional faculty who are professors, mentors, scholars, and leaders. We have more than 120 faculty members, creating one of the finest, most diverse, and most intellectually wide-ranging communities of legal scholars and clinical professors in the nation. Our professors are passionate about teaching in and out of the classroom, and they are accessible too. They'll involve you in their research, amicus briefs, clinical projects, and wholeheartedly embrace the role of mentor. Our student to faculty ratio is 7.7 7 to 1, and we often hear from our students how amazed they are at our professor's open door policies. Not only are our faculty members student driven, they are also influential and widely published scholars. They've written countless books, law review articles, textbooks, and they're quoted frequently in the news. They represent clients, file amicus briefs, and serve as counsel in impact litigation in addition to being consulted on legislation, law reform, and matters of public policy. And as our impressive faculty roster doesn't end at current professors. We also have a rich legacy of past professors, such as former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We just highlighted how at Rutgers Law, you will receive an intellectually demanding education and ample real world experience, but we don't stop there. Our Career Development Office provides you with every possible resource to combine your interests, experience, and skills into a successful career. Once you become a law student, you will be assigned an advisor and they will help you with finding internships, externships, and jobs. They also host training programs, panels, and workshops throughout the year 
on networking, resume, cover letter, writing, and more. Career Development also hosts on-campus interviews in the fall semester for upperclassmen. This allows you the opportunity to interview with law firms and businesses for an externship or post-graduation job. In addition to the dedicated counselors in our Career Development Office, Many administrators and staff members across the law school have earned a JD and have law practice experience, which they rely on to help you succeed. The Career Development Office is dedicated to helping you find meaningful employment. We know employment results are an important factor when making the decision on what law school to attend, and we think our numbers speak for themselves. The majority of our students find employment in full-time JD required or JD Advantage jobs within 10 months of graduation. Our graduates find employment across a variety of sectors with employers through New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and the United States. And no matter where in the United States you plan to practice, our alumni network will welcome you at your first job and support you on the way to your top job. Our 2000 plus alumni work at every level. They're leaders at big law firms, solo practitioners in every field of law, high profile corporate legal counsel, influential members of the judiciary and legislatures, and tireless advocates for the public interest. Some of our alum include Brian Quinn, who is the director of US public Pol policy at Audible, the world's largest seller and producer of audiobooks. Before Elizabeth Warren became a US Senator for Massachusetts and Democratic pre presidential contender, she spent her formative law school years at Rutgers Law. Rebecca Bresnik is currently the lead attorney for NASA's International Space Station, and Fabiana Pierre-Louis has been confirmed by Governor Phil Murphy for a seat on the New Jersey Supreme Court, becoming the first Black woman to sit on the court. To highlight fantastic stories such as Rebecca Bresnik's journey into space law with NASA, the law school launched a new podcast series called The Power of Attorney which features our co-deans in conversation with leading legal minds, including alumni of our law school, our professors, and others. The series gives listeners an inside look at the power of a legal education and explores what it means to be a lawyer in an ever-changing world. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. So if you're interested, be sure to look it up. At Rutgers Law, we do our best to make a high quality education as affordable as possible. Here are the costs of tuition and fees for the upcoming year. The amount shown for full-time students is per year, not per semester. Part-time students are billed per credit rather than per semester, and a total of 90 credits is required to graduate. If you are out of state and considering moving to New Jersey to attend Rutgers Law, you should be happy to hear that you can easily establish in-state residency and start paying in-state tuition in your first semester by providing our office with a few required documents like a New Jersey lease and license. When you apply to Rutgers Law, you are automatically considered for scholarships. We have many partial and full tuition scholarships, and in fact, the majority of our students each year receive a scholarship. We also collect scholarship opportunities from law firms, bar associations, and other organizations for our current students to apply to. Most students finance law school through a combination of scholarship and financial aid which is the other big area of financial support that can help you with tuition and cost. To apply for most types of aid, including loans, you are required to submit a free application for federal student aid. Depending on your circumstances, there are different types of loans and financial aid opportunities available to you. For more information on that, you can visit our website at financialaid.ruckers.edu. We have directors of financial aid at each campus who are part of the admissions team. This means you don't have to go searching across main campus for help, and you can get advice specifically from a law school financial aid expert rather than someone split across several academic programs. Now that we have covered key offerings of our JD program and how to finance your legal education, let's take a look at the application process. All law school applications in the country go through the Law School Admissions Council, or LSAC. The first thing you need to do in the application process is visit their website and create an account. All required documents needed to apply to Rutgers Law must be submitted through LSAC. Here are the documents you will need to submit when you apply. You must submit transcripts from every undergraduate and graduate institution you were enrolled in. 
This includes any school, like a community college or foreign institution as part of studying abroad. Letters of recommendations can come from professors, supervisors, or whoever you believe will write the best letter for you. If you're coming right from undergrad or recently graduated, you may want to contact a professor who you know well. If you have been in the workforce for several years, you can ask supervisors or colleagues. For the personal statement, there is no set topic. However, many successful essays include an applicant's reason for why they want to attend law school and what they would like to do with their degree, if they know already. You should aim for around 1,000 words, including why Rutgers Law specifically is also nice but not required. Your resume should highlight your work experience, especially anything related to the legal field. A one to two page resume is ideal, but for those who have extensive work experience, it can certainly be longer. Another important thing to note is on the application for Rutgers Law, you are asked to select your campus preference, Camden, Newark, or no preference. Your campus preference determines where you are assigned after being accepted. So if you know which campus you'd like to attend, be sure to select that option on that question. Whenever you begin classes for your first year, you must remain for your first year. After that, you have the freedom to switch between campuses for a semester, year, or the rest of your legal education. 157 or above on the LSAT and a 3.39 or above undergraduate GPA are considered competitive scores. It is important to keep in mind that these are not minimum scores needed to apply. Our review process is holistic, meaning that all aspects of your application are taken into consideration when making a decision. Also, we do not average LSAT scores, so your highest score carries the most weight. Here you can see all upcoming LSATs announced so far. Three months of preparation is recommended to be sure to factor that in when you are choosing a test date. The LSAT Flex is not viewed differently than the standard LSAT exam. We often get questions about the best method of preparation for the LSAT, and the answer is, it depends on how you learn. Some people know that they need more guidance and deadlines, so an online course might be right for them. Others will self-study with prep books. There are some of the LSAT prep companies that our work-study students have used and recommended in the past. And here they are on the screen. I typically say to start with Khan Academy as they offer free prep in partnership with LSAC. Last but certainly not least are the important deadlines. Our priority deadline is March 15th and our final deadline is May 15th. Submitting an application earlier in the cycle is usually better as earning a seat in the class can be less competitive and scholarship funds get limited closer to the final deadline. That being said, it's most important to make sure you are confident in your application and documents rather than meeting the March deadline. One final bit about the application process is that we have rolling admissions. The admissions committee begins reviewing files in October and it can take between six to eight weeks, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, from the date your file was made complete to receive a decision. Follow us on all these places to stay in touch and find out what new things are going on at Rutgers Law. Here's our contact information. So if you have any questions that we happen to not get to um, at the end of today, please feel free to email us. And we wanna thank you for joining us. And at this time, we are going to go ahead and open up the chat and hopefully answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I have a question. Um, student wants to retake the LSAT in January, but wanted to apply to Rutgers this month. Will that prolong the admissions process? Um, yes, in the sense that um, if you let us know you're waiting for a score, we won't finish reading your application, um, you know, and making a decision until we were to get your January uh, score. Please feel free if you have any questions, just uh, put them in the chat and then I will read them out and happily answer them for you. Uh, if admitted, can you start as full time then transition to part time? Uh, yes, that's an option. So you can start as a full time student. Um, we've had students that then, you know, pick up a job for financial reasons um, 
and they'll switch to part time. That's absolutely fine. You can also start as a part time student and then decide uh, that you'd prefer to be full time and become a full time student. Would addendums be submitted through LSAC also or to another email address or someone in admissions? Um, we actually have addendums as part of our application. So you would just go ahead and write whatever you want in those addendums and it's actually part of your application. If you um, submit your application, it's completed, and then you subsequently decide that you want to add something else, you could go ahead and email um, the email that I had up uh, on the previous slide. I can go ahead and go back to that. Um, and you can send the addendum um, that way to us. But put it in your application if you already know you're putting it in. Um, someone said, if admitted, can you participate in two certificate programs, uh, example, family law and immigration? Um, if you're able, uh, Dean Walton, I don't know if you want to maybe chime in on this one just uh, to make sure I'm correct. I, I, if you're able to um, complete them, uh, I don't see why not, but I'm not 100% sure uh, on that answer. But you would have to take um, 15, it's like 15 credits in, in both certificate programs. So you just have to be able to complete um, requirements for both the certificate programs. How do you help students and graduates find jobs outside of the region? Uh, our career development office on both campuses uh, is phenomenal. So they will actually uh, help you uh, apply for jobs. They also have like a database of jobs um, that they, they'll post job postings and um, you can apply that way as well. But career development, you'll be assigned an advisor and that advisor will help you along the way. Are you able to do more than four to four and a half years for the part time program and graduate early? You can graduate early from the part time program. Uh, we have students that will graduate, say, in like three and a half years because they'll take courses like over the summer or the winter sessions and they'll graduate early. I believe um, you have five years from when you start to complete your law degree. Um, so you could take as long as five years, but you can also finish your degree early if you're able to, to get all the courses in. How recent does the LSAT score have to be? Um, Anita? I want to jump in here one minute about the part time program. Um, now that we have, we require 90 credits to graduate, it's a little difficult for you to graduate from the part time program in less than four to four and a half years um, because you can, the most number of credits you can take per semester is 11, and you can't take any less than eight. So you will have to put in some summers. Um, if you want to graduate in less than four and a half years, you would have to switch to full time and that means 12 credits or more, but having to complete 90 credits um, is did extend the evening program by probably at least a semester. Thank you. Dean I graduated quite a while ago, but I work full time. Can I have my supervisor and mentor of mine as recommenders? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's whoever you feel confident that will write the best letters of recommendations for you. If you've had a relationship with a professor that you've continued since you've been out of school, um, feel free to add that in. Two letters of recommendations are required and a third is optional. Um, but yeah, if you've been in the workforce for a while, absolutely ask a mentor and supervisor. Uh, can you please provide advice for those who are reapplying this year? Uh, if you're reapplying this year, I'm going to put my uh, direct email into uh, the chat. So if you want to email me and we can talk about your previous application and things that you can maybe do uh, going forward, feel free to reach out to me. What is the process for students hoping to study internationally while at Rutgers? What are the typical costs associated? When do students usually choose to leave? Uh, Dean Walton, are you able to touch on that at all? Oh, sorry, I missed that one. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what is the process for students hoping to study internationally while at Rutgers? And what are the typical costs associated with when do students choose okay. to leave? Um, first of all, all of our international programs are on hold right now because of COVID. Um, normally, if you wanted to take a semester abroad, there's one in Leiden. 
which is in the spring semester of your second year. And there's another program in Graz, um, which is run through Camden. The Leiden program is run through Newark. Uh, typically, you would be taking about 12 or 14 credits in things like European, in Leiden anyway, European Union law, comparative constitutionalism, those kinds of courses, and you will spend your whole semester there, though you'll pay our tuition. The other uh, smaller courses, like in at the University of Havana, which is one week in the spring, in Guatemala, in the Dominican Republic, those are typical one week long courses where you go into a service project, professor goes with you, you will get one credit because you're also gonna be taught um, a class during that time. And the uh, one in South Africa takes a little bit longer because it takes a lot of time to get to South Africa and to be back. That's about a 10 day trip. Um, so all of that would be in your upper level, not during your first year, obviously, and um, not until you're into your second and third year. Usually it's there's someone at each location that's in charge of the international programs. It's usually one of the associate deans or vice deans, and uh, they will have information up on the website as to how you can apply for those programs. There was another question about doing two certificate programs. It's possible because some of the courses will overlap, but you're gonna have to plan that very, very carefully if you wanna try to do that. Thank you. Uh, once enrolled, how does the process for joining a clinic work? Is it really competitive to get a spot or are there enough positions for all interested students? I've never run across a student that hasn't been able to participate in the clinic before they graduate. Uh, that being said, you can't start clinic. You have to be an upperclassman and most clinics require that you take professional responsibility and evidence. You have to get those two classes under your belt before you would be able to join um, a clinic course. So usually students will start applying for clinic courses in the second semester of their 2L year or they'll complete one in their 3L year. Uh, but I haven't, I've never heard of a student say that they were not able to participate in a clinic before they graduate. There will be information sessions at each campus on the clinics when the time comes for you to register for the clinics. Um, there's no interviews. Um, you can, some of the clinics as as Ms. Simcoe said, um, require that you have to be a third year because you're going to court and there's a third year requirement if you're going to appear in court. So you'll you'll get lots and lots of information about that. Um, but virtually everyone who wants to do a clinic at some point while they're here at the law school will get into a clinic. Um, there's also a question about getting internship assistance before you start in the fall semester. The answer is no, sorry, we can't help you with that. Um, because you're technically not our student until you are actually here and taking classes. So before you actually start at the law school, you're pretty much on your own. We have someone that's been in the workforce for uh, a while, but they just started in the legal field in 2018 and they want to know should their resume submitted to Rockers um, only include legal experience. Uh, so no. Um, if you have experience that you feel is relevant or show something to us uh, that you want us to know about you and your skills, definitely put it on your resume. Do we need to know where you worked when you were 16 years old? Um, not necessarily, unless you think it's important to us, but definitely feel free to put, you know, I was a manager at a restaurant for five years before I went to law school. And I put that on there because I believe that that showed skills and I was able to, you know, write my blurb about it um, that I thought would be useful to someone coming into law school. So. It's it's up to you to decide what you think is relevant for your, your resume. Are scholarships merit based, need based, or a mix of both? Our merit scholarships that you're automatically considered for when applying are merit based. Um, so they're based primarily off of your LSAT and uh, undergraduate GPA. Uh, there are scholarships when you become upperclassmen that are need based, and so we have something called the Rutgers Law School Institutional Application on both campuses. So you would apply for that uh, as a 2L, 3L, or 4L, and you and some of them are just very specific need based. So you could apply for that. Um, other than that, you're looking at filling out financial aid, looking into loans, and things like that. Uh, are both campuses providing in-person tours? Unfortunately, right now uh, our buildings are closed to anyone that's not student, faculty, staff, or there for a business purpose. Uh, we're hoping that that will change at some point, but our deans are um, very invested in the health of our students, our faculty and our staff. So right now, uh, unfortunately you can't, we will absolutely send out an email if anything changes to let you know. We are working currently working at least on a virtual tour. So hopefully that'll help uh, a little bit. There's another question about um, 
uh, how do we help students who want to work outside the area, maybe in another part of the country, uh, California, Nebraska, Chicago, et cetera. And our career development office is really um, excellent at helping you map that out. So at the time that you come as a first year student, they will start meeting with individually, individual students and run programs for them, usually late October, early November, like right around now, you actually get assigned to a, a, a career counselor. If you think that you want to work in another another state or in another geographic area after graduation, what they'll do is help you figure out what to do those summers after your first year and after your second year so that you can start building up um, connections and start networking and start those inroads into those jobs in other parts of the country. We have been around for over 100 years. We have alumni virtually everywhere across the country that they can help put you in touch with. Um, you're not here to learn New Jersey, New York, or Pennsylvania state law. You're here to learn how to think and problem solve and do analytical thinking and to you can apply those skills anywhere in the country, not just here. Dean Walton, well, there's also a question saying how recent does the LSAT score have to be? Is there a, a rule for yeah, how far um, back you go? They will they will report to us every score earned within the last five years. Um I would tell you if it's been a while since you took the LSAT, let's say maybe three years ago, um, and if you're not happy with that score, definitely go take it again. You'll be surprised at how much it'll change in the three years since you took that score. Um, but pretty much we'd like to see a score within the last two years, which is gonna give us um, a better indication as to what your abilities are now, as opposed to when you took that LSAT five or six years ago. We have a question asking where do most students live? So I can take the Camden side of that and if Dean Walton wants to take the New York side. So in Camden, we do have on-campus housing, but it's specifically only for our 1L students. Um, and then, so up on the uh, kind of like right next to on-campus housing are, are a bunch of apartments that are considered off-campus housing. So they're private, privately leased. And we have a bunch of apartments that have just been built up on the waterfront in Camden. So a lot of our students choose to live there because um, they can stay there all three years. Sometimes it's actually cheaper than living on campus uh, and they're still right at the law school. Other than that, we have uh, PACO, which is a train that will take you to the surrounding areas and neighborhoods. So we have things like Collingswood, Haddonfield, Cherry Hill, those areas that uh, are quick enough to either hop on to PACO or students that choose to um, commute back and forth to the campus for, for Camden. Yeah, and in Newark, we do have a graduate residence hall uh, at 15 Washington Street, which is being renamed in honor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a faculty member here at Rutgers Newark many years ago. So that dedication is gonna happen, uh, I think in, in early December. So the graduate residence hall has uh, suites, um, two, three, and four bedroom suites where you get your own room. There's full kitchen, full bathroom, all furnished. Um, they run shuttle services to the grocery store and to, uh, you know, to the local Walmart. So it's really, and it's only about a few blocks up the street from, from campus, right next to the Broad Street train station and right next to Rutgers Business School, which is right next door. In addition to that, in the immediate area, we're in a very uh, big metropolitan area. There's a lot of really wonderful um, uh, towns and, and uh, uh, cities close by where a lot of our students live. You can take public transportation to the law school. There is parking on campus. So if you choose to drive, you can certainly drive and park in one of the student decks. So there's lots and lots of different options. Is there help with choosing courses once we are admitted? I'm applying as a part-time student and I wonder if you provide guidance as to how to set up a schedule to maximize summer winter semesters. So yeah, so once you're a student, so your your one hour year, your schedule is set for you. Uh, you don't get a say in what your schedule looks like. Um, but then after that you do, but you can absolutely um, schedule a meeting with the registrar. Uh, so we specifically have a registrar on both the Newark and Camden campus just for the law school students. So you can sit down and have a conversation with them to see the best way to navigate and map out uh, your law school career. Um, there was another question about um, how do we look at various universities and consider transcripts and GPA. Um, that's a complicated question um, and thank you for asking that. We certainly do look at uh, your transcript when we are looking at your application and we look at the quality of the program that you're taking. Um, you know, we know the easy courses and those one-on-one courses being taken in your senior year may not look so great 
Um, but if you are a good student and you're working hard, that's certainly going to come through whether you're at Harvard or whether you're at, at a local school, um, you know, uh, uh, Montclair State or Rowan or any of the other local schools. Um, we do take into consideration the major. Obviously, things in the STEM area are going to be more difficult. And so we understand that your GPA may not be a 3.8 in computer science or mechanical engineering, and that's understandable. Um, if you have something that you want to tell us about your undergraduate program and about your degree, by all means, put that in a separate agenda in your application so that we're not sitting there guessing, hmm, why did they take two years off in the middle? What were they doing during those two years? So feel free to, to tell us as much information as you'd like about your transcript and about your undergraduate experience. Some students do uh, take a long time to get through college. Some start at community college because that's what they could afford and they could get rid of their general education requirements by doing that. Um, so it's there's a really broad range of things that we look at when we're looking at those transcripts. And I think just if you're currently in school, just do the best that you possibly can um, and work hard. That's the important thing. Along those lines, excuse me, is there's an admissions preference for Rutgers grads? Uh, no, I mean, we, re we read holistically, so I can't say we're going to, we don't pull out, you know, students specifically that graduated from Rutgers and, and, and put them on top of the pile. Um, you know, we read everyone along the same lines. Okay, there was another question about the January LSAT. That's perfectly fine. We'll even, even accept up to April. So for this cycle, the application deadline. Our priority deadline or our first deadline is March 15th, but we'll continue to take applications up until May 15th. So you have to have your application in um, by May 15th in order to be considered for admission. And please take the LSAT by April. That would be really the absolute last administration that we'll consider. There was a question about journals. Did you answer that one, Amy? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. So um, there's a question about how do you get onto journals? And at the end of your first year, Everyone who wants to be considered for a journal, and that's like law review, race in the law, computer technology, uh, there's a public policy journal in Camden. You do a writing competition that is sponsored by the journals. Um, they, it's done anonymously, but they give you a set of cases and a question, and you can only use that information in order to write the response to the, to the question. And they pick students for those journals based on your writing. And on that submission uh, to the writing competition, there's a couple of seats that they hold out for people who have extremely high LS, uh, GPAs, cumulative GPAs, but did not make it onto the journals because of writing. But the vast majority of the students make it onto the journals um, through the writing competition. Uh, they, we have a follow up for the journal. Is it one competition or does each journal have their own? To my knowledge, each journal has has their own. Yeah, it's it's one um, here. It's one writing competition, and you submit for each journal that you're interested in. So they don't you don't have to do separate competitions. I think everybody would just say no way. <laughs> don't do separate competitions for each journal. So it's one writing project that you submit for any journal that you're interested in. There's a question about professional experience and someone has been out in the workforce for 10 plus years that I would consider that to be a plus in the application, just like lots of other things are considered a plus. Um, you may want to tell us about why you're shifting gears and moving into uh, the legal field and what are your hopes and dreams with accomplishing that. And some of it has to do often with the kind of work that you do. And seeing that um, with a law degree that you could probably push yourself ahead in the workforce or something that you have wanted to do your whole life. And now is the time when you finally could do it. Um, and a student applies as a part time student, but when the fall semester starts, they want to switch to full time. Is that possible? And what is the timeline um, for switching? Okay, well, <laughs> it depends. And with a lot of things, it depends. It depends if we have space in the day class. Um, if you apply part time now, and let's say in April, you decide that you want to go full time, that will probably be fine. But if you're telling me this in August or late July, it will depend on whether or not we have space in the day class. And this past year, we did not. Uh, the year before, we did not. And so we could not allow people to switch from evening to day before classes started. 
when they ask very late in the cycle. We start classes the third week of August. So everything, and there's orientation the week before. So it's a little bit earlier than um, starting around, you know, Labor Day when most um, undergraduate schools start. There is not an admissions preference for Rutgers grads, but there is not a negative for Rutgers grads. I get that often. It's like, oh, the law school doesn't like Rutgers graduates. Actually, it's a positive in many ways because we know the quality of the courses that you're taking. I know professors in New Brunswick. I know professors here in Newark. Amy, I'm sure, knows professors in Camden. So, um, in a lot of ways, you know, when we see your transcript and we see those courses, we know that you've been through a rigorous program. So, in a way, it's a plus, but it's not, um, uh, you know, you're. It's not a negative. And there's lots of people who say, oh, they hate Rutgers students. It's like, no, we don't, not at all. If you have an LSAT score on file, but are taking a future LSAT after applying, can your application for admission be reviewed with that prior score? I just note that you're retaking the exam. If we know you're retaking your exam, we wait for that score, um, assuming that you're retaking the exam because you want us to see that score. So we will hold your file until you have the most recent score that you want us to include because it's holistic, right? So we need to we need to see everything at once before we can make a decision. Yeah, if if you um, are already registered for a future LSAT, we will not, the program that we have set up to find complete files um, will say future LSAT field is blank. So your file will not be completed um, if you have a test date that's in there, which LSAT updates those, our applicant pool every 24 hours. Um, and uh, frankly, the committee is not going to want to look at your file now and then look at it again three months from now with a new LSAT score. They want to see everything so that we can go through it once. Do we consider factoring graduate degrees? Absolutely. So graduate degree is a plus, right? It's another, it's another rigorous um, degree program that you've been through. Uh, and, you know, even, you know, you may have a weaker undergrad GPA, but then you went on to graduate school and you did really well at graduate school. Uh, so absolutely having a graduate degree is a plus on your application. You don't have to have one, but, you know, it's another thing that we look at. Uh, there's a question about commuting. Um, so your schedule will be pretty set for you. And I think if you're a full-time student, you'll see that um, here in Newark, Amy can talk about uh, about Camden, but in Newark, pretty much your day's gonna start at 9.30 in the morning and end on Monday through Thursday around 3.45. Fridays, you'll end a little bit earlier because there's only one or two classes on Fridays. So it's gonna be pretty much like going to work every day where you're gonna show up at nine o'clock and you're probably not gonna leave before 4.30. Uh, so you can plan around that. There's always a big break in the middle of the day where students have time for lunch and there might be a period where they don't have a class. You'll never have more than two classes in a row because um, your brain will be fried if you had three classes in a row. And I think Amy can also attest to that having graduated from, yes. from Camden. Um, so maybe you wanna talk about the schedule in Camden a little bit, Amy. Uh, schedule is run pretty similar, especially in your 1L year. So you are in classes Monday through Friday. So like Dean Walton said, if you're a full-time student, you would treat it like you would a full-time job. Uh, so most students are there nine to five. Uh, Friday usually ends early, like earlier in the afternoon. Uh, but like we said, you don't have any say over your 1L schedule and it is structured specifically to have you on campus every day. Uh, the beauty of becoming an upperclassman is you get to make your own schedule. So if you only want it to be there on Tuesday and Thursday, or if you wanted to subject yourself to three classes in a row, you could. Um, totally up to you. But yeah, your your first year definitely a Monday through Friday. And if we don't get to your questions, or we didn't answer completely, or you have another question, um, throw us an email. Uh, the contact information up here, where it's admissions at law um, we all answer those emails and we're happy to, to email back with you if there's something that we might have missed. But there were a lot of questions in the chat, so we might have missed some of you. We do have a few more minutes, so if we did happen to miss your question and you want to type it in again so that it's like right up at the top for us, uh, please feel free. We'll leave it open for a few more minutes to answer some final questions. And again, this is um, being recorded. So tomorrow you will get an email um, with the recording link. So that way, if you wanted to watch it again um, before you follow up with any questions, you'd be more than welcome to.
Okay, any last questions? Okay, there you go. Um, crossover between IP and international law. Um, sometimes <laughs> um, there are international patents. Sometimes, um, you know, that's a little bit more of a stretch, I think. What do you think, Amy? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, um, and that's because the patent laws and, and regulations in different countries vary a lot. So um, uh, I'm not quite sure what you're thinking in those terms, um, but that would definitely be a stretch. Um, and clinics that have stood out to our students, um, all of them, <laughs> you know, if they if they're, get on our website, look at the list of the clinics, look at all the different things that they do, everything from working with welfare children in the child advocacy, advocacy clinic to representing people in tax court to um, doing civil uh, work with tenants and landlord uh, rights, um, dealing with uh, juvenile justice and the, the uh, detention centers here in Essex County and also in, in Camden. I think they're all amazing. You get really close um, supervision, working with a faculty member and also working with real clients where you are gonna make a difference in their lives. And I think that they are just all really a wonderful experience, no matter which one you decide to take. I agree, hands down, uh, the best experience that I had in law school, I was able to participate in two clinics. I did child uh, and family advocacy, where I represented children in neglect and abuse cases. Um, and it's, it's real life experience. You're doing real lawyering, you're appearing in front of the court, um, you're being supervised by your professor who's also an attorney. Um, so you have that net underneath of you, which makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and then from that experience, I was able to extern for the family law judge. And then uh, he offered me a clerkship after graduation. So it's also a wonderful opportunity to network and possibly get a job afterwards. Uh, I also did a prisoner reentry program, which was phenomenal. I don't think that's a clinic anymore, but we do have like a just a juvenile justice that helps with uh, reentry as well. There's a question. And there's a question about. I was just gonna say, there's a question about cultural artifacts. Can you email that to me directly? I'll throw my email in here um, because it's a little more complicated than me just giving you an answer off the top of my head. We had a question if part-time students can participate in clinics. So yes, you can, right? So any courses are open to you. It's a little bit more difficult if you're an evening part-time student because most clinics involve you, you know, appearing in court and that's during the day. So you'd have to have a flexible work schedule um, or like, I know in Camden, they've been able to do, um, clinics like in the evening with like the PA public defender's office. Um, so it is possible. It's just a little bit more difficult if you were working during the day. Okay. Another question about, um, having a master's from the UK, uh, someone who's an occupational therapist, um, your, if you want those transcripts considered, they do have to go to LSAC and they will do a um, evaluation of your transcripts for us so that they will be able to tell us how well you did um, in your program and also if it is the equivalent of a master's degree here in the US. Um, so that is, is how that will be considered. Your GPA from your master's program or any master's programs are not considered. Um, I'll take that back. We consider them when we're looking at your file and doing a review of your file, but they are not factored into your overall GPA. Only your undergraduate uh, courses are factored into your overall GPA. Okay, we got time for maybe one more question. Okay, I think we're good. Um, oh, are students. Transfer students considered for scholarships? Um, so no, from the merit based, um, you, you don't have that opportunity, but like I had mentioned previously, we have institutional, um, scholarships that you can apply for as a 2L, 3L and 4L. And uh, I work personally with them and I can tell you they've been awarded to transfer students. So there's opportunity to get an institutional scholarship, but not like a merit scholarship. Like when you apply, if that makes sense. Okay, I think we can certainly wrap this up. Um, thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Amy. Um, I hope that you really are on your law school journey and that you find the law school that is absolutely right for you. And obviously we hope that it's gonna be Rutgers. Um, but I hope you learned a lot from this presentation. 
uh, please again feel free to email us or send an email to the general admissions email address and uh, we'll be happy to help you along the way. Okay, so long everyone. Bye and thank you. Bye.